Good evening, Pacifica family and honored guests. My name is Seth Wong. I'm a sophomore at Pacifica, and I have the distinct privilege of welcoming you tonight to The Great Conversation. As Mr. O'Neill said, The Great Conversation is a way for the Pacifica students and community to participate in a dialogue that transforms how we think and live well. TGC taps into the great conversations, debates, and issues of our time and throughout history. It is an opportunity to get to build and develop what we have learned so that we can better our character through the four years spent at this amazing school. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing you to Dr. Kenneth Way, professor and chair of Old Testament and Semitics at Biola University. Dr. Way will be speaking to you tonight about the significance of the Isaiah scroll, including, including its ancient witness of Jesus Christ before his birth. In approximately 586 BCE, the Babylonian Empire had destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem and the Jews were exiled to Babylon. After the Persians conquered Babylon in 539 BCE, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. However, the Jews were not united and the period between the 5th and 4th centuries BCE were marked by political fragmentation and religious disputes. During this time, the Jews were ruled by the Persian Empire, and the high priests of the Second Temple were appointed by the Persian king. The Jews were divided into several factions, including the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and the Zealots, who had different interpretations of Jewish law and practice. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in a series of 12 caves near the Dead Sea, then controlled by Jordan, between 1946 and 1956 by Bedouin shepherds and a team of archaeologists. The main significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that the earliest copy of the Masoretic text we had was from the 10th century AD. So the scholarly assumption was that the Hebrew scriptures must have been woefully corrupted. The belief was that we did not have a good text. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and they added a major chapter to biblical history by giving scholars a better understanding of the Jewish community during the Second Temple period. They are likely the most important discovery for biblical veracity and textual authenticity that we have. And most importantly for Christians, they show that the Isaiah prophecy predates Christ. Now I'd like to welcome Mr. Scott Moffat, owner of the copy of the scroll and a great friend of Dr. Way. Mr. Moffat, a dedicated history educator, holds a BA and MA in history from Cal State Fullerton. With a passion for teaching, he has been shaping young minds since 1995, teaching at various local colleges, including Biola University. In addition to his academic pursuits, he has served in several ministry positions, including senior pastor, and in recent years, he has been involved in the family business publishing educational material for elementary school teachers. He is a husband and proud father of two teenage girls who attend Pacifica Christian High School. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Moffat. He basically said everything I was going to say, but um, <laughs> it was interesting. I was I was sitting here and uh, watching people walk in and look at the scroll, and I had a little conversation with Dr. Way and uh, David O'Neill about why is it that people are so interested in something they can't read? And this is a foreign language. It's an ancient language. At one time, it was almost a dead language, um, but it draws people. Everywhere the Dead Sea Scrolls has been exhibited throughout the world, and it has been taken different places around the world. Um, there was a time where Israel was allowing the Dead Sea Scrolls to leave its borders. And uh, there were just been some recent ex exhibits in Los Angeles, San Diego, all throughout the United States, and each time it's drawn hundreds of thousands of people. It draws people. Why, is it, why does it draw so many people? Interesting talking about the things that were mentioned, the history of the Jews, the history in, of our Old Testaments, the stories that we've read, the stories that we memorized. And there was a time where people were starting to doubt that these things actually existed. And yet, fortunately, there were certain people that went out and looked and found some of these ancient sites. The era of the golden age of archaeology wasn't a professor. It was a rich man that went out and looked and found things and dug up and showed the world. You can go to the British Museum today and see a lot of the things that were found by amateur archaeologists. Um, in the late 18, 1800s, we see the rise of the professional academic realm, and we see the professional archaeologists emerge on the scene. In 1902, there was an interesting discovery. It was called the Nash Papyrus. 
It was one of the first ancient Hebrew documents discovered, and it was discovered in Egypt. And in this discovery, they found the Ten Commandments and other ancient Hebrew texts. And because of that, they were able to find and understand an ancient Hebrew character description. And uh, nothing happened after that. Not very, William Albright, probably the greatest archaeologist of the 20th, of the 19th, 20th century, he made it the benchmark of his career, this discovery. And yet we find a lot of things happening in Israel. Um, it wasn't, wasn't called Israel at the time, in Palestine. The Zionist movement had emerged. The, the Sykes-Picot Treaty happened after the end of World War I. And the British mandate begins in Israel. And with this, we see a huge, huge uh, movement occur in Israel where Jews are coming back, they're cultivating, they're rebuilding, they're re rediscovering their language. And we find at the end of the mandate in 1948, uh, a discovery occurs in Qumran. Two Bedouin boys, actually three Bedouin boys, they, one of them throws a rock into a cave and they find, uh, they, they hear a crash, and they knew that they knew there was something in there. There were people that were digging through these caves, finding archaeological artifacts and selling them on the black market. That still happens today, by the way. And uh, they talked about it. I heard a crash in this cave. And they said, well, tomorrow morning, we're going to get up early, and we're going to find out what's in that cave. The youngest of the three, he gets up before his brothers, and goes in that cave and finds these cylinder seals, these clay jars, and finds these old documents, these paper, these papers. And they were made out of parchment, animal skin. They don't know what they are. They see a language they don't understand, and they, they talk to a guy named Kando. He was a local tradesman. Uh, he sold shoes and trinkets and things like that. And they brought it to him because he bought these things. He, he purchased these things off these young boys. And he didn't know what they were either. He thought it was a Syriac language. Um, he takes it to the Syrian Orthodox Church outside of Jerusalem. And he, he gives it to a guy named Mar Samuel. He was the, the cosmopolitan of the local Syrian church. And he looked at it and he said, no, this isn't Syriac. Uh-huh. Well, let's, let's take it to someone who we can trust. They, they were very untrustful people, towards Westerners especially. But there were some Americans in Jerusalem that for some reason he decided he wanted to trust. Uh, there was a school there called the American uh, School of Oriental Studies. And there was a visiting professor there by the name of John Trevor. And John Trevor was there studying trees, of all things. And... Uh, he was, he, was, he was there at the right time. The right man at the right time was there. And uh, the head of the school was gone. He, he was off doing something else. And he told John Trevor, you're in charge while I'm gone. And John Trevor had just studied the Nash papyrus. He was well versed with uh, what they called uh, Paleo-Hebrew, old ancient Hebrew. And uh, Mar Samuel, the, the Syrian um, Orthodox Church leader, he brings these scrolls. They, it went from Kando to Mar Samuel. And from Mar Samuel, he takes it to John Trevor and says, what are these? Didn't think they were very, you know, very worthy, really. And uh, John Trevor said, let, let me have them for one night. And I'll, I'll look at it over the night, and I'll, I'll do some research and give you an answer in the morning. Well, John Trevor looked at... The, the big scroll, the one that you see here, he enrolled it and said, huh, what is this? And he looked at the Nash Papyra, and he looked at it, and he said, this looks, this is Paleo-Hebrew. And he started to do, decipher it, and he starts to tremble a little bit. This is the book of Isaiah. And uh, he's like, wow. So he starts, they didn't have the internet at those, in those days, you know, so he, and uh, so he, he copied some of the, the characters, and he wrote back to some people and tried to figure out what they were. Well, the next day, he got some friends and uh, some other scholars, and he met with Mar Samuel, and he said, this is, these are ancient scriptures, Old Testament scriptures. This is, this is something else. And he said, and John Trevor is an interesting guy. He, 
he wasn't just a, a scholar, but he was also a, an amateur semi-pro photographer. He made money through college taking pictures and selling them to the press, and he was very well versed with, with, with photography. And he, he convinced them to take photographs. He said, you don't mind if I take photographs of this, do you? And, and they said, he said, well, okay, and um, they were, again, suspicious. And so the story of, of John Trevor taking photographs is a very interesting story. In fact, uh, he wrote a book called uh, The Untold Story of Qumran. And in fact, I, I talked to John Trevor's son a few years ago. I interviewed him on the phone. His son was a very well-known political cartoonist, it turned out to be. And he told me that his dad was dodging bullets as he looked for film to take pictures of this thing. And there was a certain kind of film that he was looking for, a 9 by 12 millimeter uh, Kodak film. And it was very hard to find. And he went from camera shop to camera shop to camera shop throughout the old city of Jerusalem on, on Jaffa Street, if you've ever been there. And he was getting frustrated trying to find film. But he ultimately talked to some British uh, museum curators that were trying to take photographs of tile work, ancient tile work. And he, he struck a deal with them, got some film, took the film back to his uh, college, went in the basement, and took photographs of the great Isaiah scroll, front and back. There were two other scrolls as well. There was a Habakkuk commentary, and there was also a very well-known work called the, the Community Rule, which was the Code of the Essenes, the behavioral type of uh, code uh, book for the, for the Essenes. And so he took photographs of it, sent the photographs uh, back home, took the, took the negatives, sent them back home. And John Trevor, by the way, the man who did who brought us, it was the first guy to, to, dis, to recognize what this was, subsequently was, was put down or was kind of dismissed by the higher echelons of academia. John Trevor comes home. He spends the rest of his life teaching part-time college. He ends up at Claremont University and uh, donated the, the negatives to Claremont University. Um, the real Dead Sea Scrolls, after their discovery, the Great Isaiah Scroll especially, uh, interesting what happened. I have some dates on the front of my stands here. The first one was 19, was 150 BC. That, that's an estimated time of when the original scrolls were written. Uh, very reliable number or date. The second one here is 1947-48. That is the year that the scroll was discovered. And in fact, it was the same year that Israel became a nation. If you do your research, you'll discover that the, the very day that the, the, the Israel was given nationhood was the exact same day that the Great Isaiah Scroll was released. Um, the press release happened to the world that the scroll existed. There was a man in Jerusalem, um, a scholar by the name of Eliezer Il 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 Sukanik was his name. And he was a, uh, an archaeologist. He was the first Jew to see the scrolls and recognize the scrolls for what they were. He tried to buy them right away. And they didn't want to sell it to him. Uh, Mar Samuel wanted money. And the only place that had money in the late 1940s was the United States. So the, scrolls made, the, the Great Isaiah Scroll made its way back to New York after that. And they, it was advertised in the New York Times for $250,000. So Koenig sent agents over from Israel, covertly bought the scrolls for that price, sent them back to Israel, and they're still there to this day. If you go to Jerusalem, you will see a facsimile in Jerusalem, and that facsimile is based on photographs that were taken years later. And the reason I bring that up is because the original Dead Sea Scrolls and all the caves, uh, the four caves were the big ones. Uh, the cave one was where the Great Isaiah Scroll was discovered. Cave four was the mother load of all the thousands of fragments. Um, again, the only intact book was this one right here. Um, but uh, he purchased it, you know, they, and um, a lot of the pieces and um, the scrolleries, they called them, they called them scrolleries, the guys that were the first to, you know, try to decipher what was there. There's some famous photographs of the people working in the scrolleries, like smoking their cigarettes, you know. 
One guy has a, a piece of the scroll, and he's got a cigarette, and he's looking at it. And then somebody had the great idea of, well, this is leather, right? What do you do with leather? I mean, how do you treat leather? You clean it. Well, hey, let's get some leather conditioner. And so they started applying leather conditioner to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so a lot of those Dead Sea Scroll fragments, most of them today have turned black. Uh, I've, I've seen them. I've been to the Shrine Book Museum, and I've seen a lot of these original scroll fragments. And you can't even see them. They have to, they have to put a special light on them just to s- decipher what you're reading. That's what makes this so special. This, what, you see, what you see in front of you today um, is what the scroll looked like just a few weeks after its discovery. This is, this is, this is as accurate of a depiction you're going to see. The actual scroll in Jerusalem has turned dark as well. The last time that was seen publicly was 19, 2004. Uh, George Bush was in Jerusalem, and they brought it out. They rolled it out for him to see. That's the last time it's been seen publicly. Um, what's interesting about this is it's preserved for us to see. And um, how did the facsimile become in existence? Well, in 2001, there was uh, a group of people that wanted to bring the Dead Sea Scrolls to North Korea. They asked Israel if they would bring it there. Israel said, no, we're not going to let you have it. Um, it was mentioned by Seth that it was discovered in the, near the Dead Sea. That was a Jordan um, area of influence prior to Israel becoming a nation. Uh, Jordan controlled that area. And the whole idea of provenance, where things are discovered, the countries want things back. And so there was a lot of discrepancy about that. There was a lot of fears that it would be seized, so Israel says no more. The biblical books will never leave Israel again. And so they said, well, they, they approached a company in London called Facsimiles Limited, and they asked, us, they asked them, can you make us a copy of the Great Isaiah Scroll? And they said, I don't know, we'll, we'll try to do that. So they contacted Claremont University. They got those, those negatives that John Trevor took. They shipped them to Italy, and they handmade 39 facsimiles of the Great Isaiah Scroll. Academia loves this thing. Academia has fought over this. Uh, for many years, you couldn't even get information about what was on these scrolls. There was a lot of speculation. What is, what is actually being, what did they really write? Does it match up to our modern day scriptures? Some people even snuck photographs out and caused controversy. Some local famous professors, Cal State Long Beach. Um, <laughs> but um, you're, you're in a very special place tonight. I want you to really sit, sit there and understand how privileged it is for you to be in this room. There has been very little teaching and preaching alongside of this scroll. To preach Christ next to the great Isaiah scroll, very, very few people have had that privilege. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand the the baton to Dr. Kenneth Way, um, got his PhD at Hebrew Union University, Hebrew Union College, went to Moody, wrote a great dissertation on the donkey and the mule, and so, not the mule, but the donkey and ceremony, but I like mules, so I'm going to say that. So anyway, Dr. Way. Thank you, Scott. What a privilege. Uh, Thank you truly, Scott, uh, for this marvelous work. Um, Isn't this amazing? It really is. So the privilege is mine. Wow, nice picture. Um, Hey, Biola University, right? (laughs) So... um, How's that for a transition? Uh, So uh, I do teach at Biola University, uh, actually at Talbot School of Theology, which is the seminary and graduate school um, uh, of the university. Uh, I teach Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, and um, I've been there for 
17 years now. So um, anyway, uh, I simply wanted to say by starting with this, I simply wanted to make sure I had a word in for Biola University. Um, and I, I, I just want to say this. I just want to say the B in Biola, it's about this, right? It's about the Bible. Uh, the B is there for a reason. It's why we were founded. It's what we do. We teach the Bible. Uh, and so whatever subject matter uh, one studies at Biola, uh, one is trained to think biblically about it. Uh, and that's, that's our distinctive. That's the angle that we bring. That's the, uh, the value added, if you will. <laughs> Um, at Biola University. So I simply just wanted to make that commercial uh, to, uh, to invite you to consider studying at Biola uh, and maybe even someday uh, Talbot as well for seminary. Um, I mostly teach graduate uh, classes, um, almost exclusively. And, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting a lot more undergrads who are starting to take our Hebrew uh, sequence uh, so, uh, so that's becoming more and more a thing. So anyway, that's a little bit about Biola. Um, it is so wonderful to just be here behind this great scroll. You should all be looking at the scroll and not at me. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is just tremendous. Almost 24 feet, one continuous scroll. This is the best preserved scroll from Qumran that was found in 1947. So cave number one, uh, let's go straight to that. Let's, let's talk a little bit just about nomenclature here. Uh, you'll see uh, on the, the workhorse here, uh, just using some equine uh, language there for Scott. Um, the, uh, um, th this nomenclature of number one, and then Q, and then ISA for Isaiah, and then superscript A. What does all of this mean? Uh, one is, of course, cave one, okay? So every scroll from the Dead Sea has uh, a name like this, marking which cave it came from, what, uh, it gives like an abbreviation for the content of the scroll. Um, and, uh, oh, and the Q. The Q is the site. It's the archaeological site where these things were found. So that's Qumran. Qumran is spelled with a Q. Okay, so Qumran is a site uh, by the Dead Sea. Uh, so it's on the north northwestern uh, uh, portion of the Dead Sea. Uh, the, the site of Qumran is at about 1,100 feet below sea level. That's what the site of Qumran is at. Uh, you can go down lower to the surface of the water, uh, which is about 1,400 uh, feet below sea level. But, um, but the site of Qumran uh, is the place where these, this Essene community was living. Uh, they were the ones who were responsible for producing texts like this, where they were copying them, preserving them, and uh, also storing them away in caves uh, that were right around Qumran. Uh, so uh, so we th we're thankful for that, uh, that they did that. Uh, these caves are sort of like Genizas. I don't know if you know the word Geniza. Uh, sometimes, you know, synagogues um, will have a room designated uh, in the synagogue. It's basically a storage room for old texts. Often biblical texts uh, will be stored there. Um, these caves were essentially Genizas. That's what they were. Um, and uh, because they were caves and they were sealed off, it also was a great place to preserve scrolls like this. Um, so uh, that's, that's why we have such a beautiful text preserved before you. And actually, what you have here is way better than what I've got on the screen. So, um, so but this is, this is one of those early photos uh, of the text um, before it darkened as as Mr. Moffat explained. Um, it, it is tragic uh, today to see the actual originals. They're extremely dark. You can't read anything on them. And so uh, facsimiles like this really are wonderful to have today. 
Okay, a um, couple things. So um, two of the individuals that Mr. Moffat mentioned are pictured here. Uh, so these are two of the Bedouin uh, responsible for the find. Um, and a photo uh, above them is uh, of the site of Qumran. Okay, and you can see um, these... Um, Ah, that doesn't work. That's okay. Uh, these, these caves over here are like that mother load we talked about. Cave four is over here. Uh, cave one is actually not in the picture, but there's a road that goes over uh, into the mountains, into the hills, uh, and that's where cave one uh, was located. Okay? Um, cave one is pictured on the far left here. Uh, this is a photo taken from inside cave one, looking out to the ruins of Qumran. Uh, so you can see it's pretty close. Uh, the ruins of Qumran are, are located just right here. This is basically where the, the ancient site of Qumran is. Okay? So, you know, they stored these scrolls in the caves all around the region. Uh, there are 11 officially, well, no, uh, now there's 12, actually. Uh, 11 caves have gotten all the press for a long time. A few years ago, they actually found Cave 12 uh, right in the same area. Um, they were scouring this region for quite a while, trying to find every little crevice as possible. Uh, so now there is, a, there is officially one more cave known, but uh, there wasn't much in it. That's why it didn't get a lot of fanfare, but um, it was nothing like Cave 1 or Cave 4. Um, so check this out. This... Uh, <laughs> This is pretty phenomenal. Um, Scott mentioned this as well. So this is the actual ad that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is the ad that actually, um, you know, when Sukenik found out about this and he sent his son, Yigel, um, Yigel Yadin, he was formerly Sukenik, because um, he was the son of Eliezer Sukenik. But anyway, um, names are confusing, by the way, at that time. A lot of Israelis were changing their names um, for various reasons. But, um, but anyway, Sukenik sent his son, among others, as in a kind of clandestine operation to New York uh, to go and purchase these uh, scrolls for $250,000. Uh, not a bad deal. Um, and, uh, and then Yadin, uh, Gail Yadin, once he purchased them, he immediately shipped them back to Israel, where they remain today. Okay, so pretty amazing. Uh, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice. So the four Dead Sea Scrolls. So th there was the four, I, I should say, from Cave 1, there were actually seven scrolls. Four of them went up for sale in New York, um, and the other three were still in Israel at the time. So, uh, but, uh, so today, uh, when you go to Israel, if you go to the Israel Museum and you see the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, you go to a facility that looks like this. This is known as the Shrine of the Book, the Shrine of the Book, it's a nice name. Uh, it's a part of the Israel Museum today. Uh, the, the roof of this building uh, follows the contours of the lids that were on the jars. So the distinctive jars that were found in the caves that contained the scrolls, the, uh, the lid is shaped just like this, like this uh, white uh, uh, roof that you see here, okay? Um, so the shrine of the book is underneath this, this white lid, okay? When you go inside, you see this circular display in the center. That's the centerpiece. What is on display in that circular exhibit is this scroll right here. Uh, that, that's also a facsimile. When you go to the shrine of the book and you see it, it's, it's a facsimile. It's not actually the original. And the, the reason why is because of what Mr. Moffat mentioned if you looked at the original, you wouldn't see anything. <laughs> the original is not looking so good these days. Uh, and that's why they actually have a facsimile on display uh, 
at the Israel Museum. So, um, by the way, underneath this dome, they have all seven scrolls from Cave One. This 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 um, uh, facility is devoted to the Cave One um, manuscripts. Okay. All right, so that's 1Q Isaiah A. Oh, I didn't mention what the sub superscript A is all about, right? So uh, that's because there are two of the, there are two Isaiah scrolls from cave one. Um, the other one, B, is, uh, is very poor and fragmentary. Uh, it's nothing like A. Uh, the A manuscript is complete. It's the whole book. It's chapters one through 66. Uh, it's the whole thing. So, and it's, of course, very well preserved. Not all of the texts are this well preserved. Okay, so let's, um, let's just kind of talk a little bit about the book of Isaiah. Uh, what do we know about this character named Isaiah? Uh, that uh, is the namesake for the book. First of all, I just want to say that... Um, he was a real guy. He was a historical figure. And uh, we don't just know him from the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, but we know him, uh, we know him from archaeology as well. So I wanted to say a little bit about that. First of all, uh, the time frame, like when did Isaiah live? We're talking roughly 740 to about 700 B.C. So we're talking late 8th century BC, all right? Uh, right in the first verse of the book of Isaiah, you get his CV, you know, uh, all the kings under which the prophet served. Uh, basically, the prophet Isaiah was an advisor to a series of kings like Ahaz uh, and um, uh, well, starting even before that with Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and then finally um, the well-known Hezekiah. All right, so four kings of Judah in Jerusalem uh, were uh, an audience uh, to the prophet Isaiah. So pretty phenomenal. Okay, so what are we looking at in these pictures? Uh, well, we know what this is. This is the Temple Mount today, but what I've marked here in the red is the uh, location where a seal was found. Yeah, it's down at the bottom, sorry. Uh, some of you are, uh, some of you have the Bible blocking your view, so uh, that's okay. So um, anyway, but down in the, in the bottom of the picture is just the area marked where a seal impression was excavated. This seal impression mentions Isaiah the prophet, okay? I've got a picture of it, so don't worry. Here it comes. There it is, okay. So uh, this, is, this is the seal impression. The picture on the left, uh, the far left, is a picture of the actual context, the archaeological context uh, from which the seal impression was uncovered. Uh, it was found down at the uh, floor level of that photograph. If you kind of look down at where there's some bedrock exposed, uh, it was down on that floor level that there were various 8th century uh, artifacts uh, datable things, all very clearly datable to the 8th century BC. Among them uh, were some seal impressions. Uh, this, the, the fancy word for these things are uh, boule, uh, B-U-L-L-A-E for the plural, uh, or bula uh, for the singular. So, um, but the bula is basically a lump of clay that is stamped with a seal. Okay, so the seals are, of course, made of, you know, semi-precious stones and so forth. And they're, um, they, they're, they're cut in mirror image. Usually they're inscribed, uh, giving the name of an official or something like that. Uh, so a lot of important people are mentioned in these seals. Well, anyway, we've got a seal impression of Isaiah the prophet. Um, you know, some of these, you know, the, some of these Seal impressions, um, you know, these days people suspect forgeries and different things. Are they authentic? Whatever. Well, this one, there's no doubt. I just want you to know this particular seal impression was excavated by Elat Mazar, who is 
famous uh, in Jerusalem archaeology. Um, this was a legitimate thing. This wasn't like some black market item that just popped up and uh, someone bought it for $250,000. Uh, no, this was found in a, in a legal um, licensed excavation in Jerusalem, and it's now in the Israel Museum. What does it say? This is phenomenal. I love this. Uh, so uh, what we have here is belonging to, this is a, a Lamed uh, preposition, belonging to Yeshiyahu, okay? Uh, so um, belonging to Isaiah, uh, and then uh, it's the Navi. So uh, uh, Lishayahu Hanavi is what we what we read here. Lishayahu Hanavi. Um, so you can see not all of it is preserved. Some of it we reconstruct uh, based on the spacing and um, and what is most likely based on what we have. Uh, there's no reason to question the reconstruction. I think, um, I think it's good. Um, but uh, belonging to Isaiah the prophet. This is standard uh, kind of nomenclature on seals. Seals typically start with the preposition belonging to, uh, and then you get the personal name, and then you often get their, uh, their position or their, um, their uh, uh, occupation or something like that. Uh, so this is a pretty cool one, and I, I just had to share that with you. So he was a real guy. That's my point. Okay, so there you go. That's the prophet Isaiah. Well, what about the book of Isaiah? Um, one class I love to teach at Biola Talbot is uh, Old Testament Survey. It's a class in which we cover every book of the Old Testament. And what I do is I, I have theme statements for each and every book. For Isaiah, this is my theme statement, okay? So there it is. I, I try to be brief. I mean, I try. Uh, so uh, with Isaiah, it's really hard because um, there's a lot in Isaiah. God's plans for judgment and deliverance through the Messiah in the near and distant future. So I start with God's plans because that's actually what the book is doing. It's revelation from God. That's, this, that's what a prophet does, by the way. They speak God's words. They, they speak God's oracles, uh, the word of the Lord. Um, and uh, and, and in, in Isaiah's prophecies, uh, we have lots of judgment. We have lots of deliverance. We also have the most messianic material in the whole Bible, right? So we have to get Messiah in our statement, um, and, it's, and it's talking about things that are going to happen in Isaiah's time, in the near future, as well as things in the distant future, like in the, you know, 150 years or 300 years after the time of Isaiah and so forth, or, you know, 2,400 years after the time of Isaiah. So, um, so anyway, God's plans for judgment and deliverance in the near and distant future. Some of the other themes that the book of Isaiah um, elucidates are as follows. The trustworthiness of the Lord, okay? Uh, one of the ways we see this in the book of Isaiah is that the way King Ahaz is depicted early in Isaiah is contrasted with the way Hezekiah is depicted a little bit later. Um, Ahaz failed to trust in the Lord. Instead, he put his trust in Assyria um, that didn't go so well. Uh, Hezekiah is kind of the opposite as a model of one who did trust in the Lord and listened to the prophecies of Isaiah. Um, so anyhow, that's interesting. The trustworthiness of the Lord is the theme there. Also, of course, God's sovereignty and judgment and deliverance. Also, of course, hope in a future Davidic king. Also, the servant of the Lord. This is the Eved Adonai, the servant of the Lord. Notice the chapters I've marked here, Isaiah chapter 41 through 53. These are the so-called servant songs in Isaiah. Uh, it's the part that contains Isaiah 53, uh, talking about the Messiah so clearly. And, uh, and so the servant of the Lord uh, is what we have there. And finally, uh, the incomparability or incomparability, I don't know how to say that word, 
incomparability of Israel's God. This is one of the great themes of the prophecies of Isaiah that God will, he reveals through the prophet, God reveals his plans. And then God goes on to kind of boast about the fact that he can do this. Like, there is no other God like me. There is no other God beside me. I work alone. There's no, I'm uncontested, you know? And God makes a big deal out of this because he can. And we need to hear that because Isaiah, um, the prophet, when he gives these oracles of God, he's talking about a God that is different than every other God, so-called, of the ancient world or of the present world. When God says, these are my plans, God says it and he says, I'm going to do it, right? Like, I'm actually going to do what I say. These are my plans and they, they happen, right? And so he's trustworthy, he is incomparable, and uh, we can trust in him. All right, um, now, I gotta make a point here that uh, this, this is where I get a little heady, right? Um, so I have to first tell you some context for my point. The critical outline of Isaiah, this is kind of standard fare, uh, in biblical studies today. In biblical studies today, the critical scholars, and by that I mean like if you pick up a typical commentary by like a mainstream Bible scholar, uh, they're going to analyze the book of Isaiah in three parts. They're gonna say there's a first Isaiah and a second Isaiah, and a, some of them will also talk about a third Isaiah. Um, and here are the divisions. So first being chapters one through 39, 1 through 39 is um, most of the critical scholars will say that's the historical Isaiah. That's where we see the prophet interacting with those four Judean kings. Um, that's, you know, probably represents some of what really happened in history, you know, and then, but then they'll say second Isaiah was clearly written by someone else at a later time. And third, if they hold to a third Isaiah, they'll say that was written by perhaps even a third person. So perhaps there's three authors uh, is how critical scholars would approach this. Now, the reason why I go into this, first, I simply want to say, I, I don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, proverbially. Um, I think there's some truth to what they're saying. Some, there's, there is some. And, and what I mean by that is that there are different contexts to these three portions of the book of Isaiah. In the first, so-called first Isaiah, you have the Assyrian period. Um, that's the context, right? The historical context. In so-called second Isaiah, it's basically, it has in view the Babylonian period, the exilic period. So first Isaiah is pre-exilic, second Isaiah, exilic or Babylonian. Third Isaiah, so-called, is uh, the Persian period, post-exilic. Okay, that is true. Okay, there are the, each each portion of Isaiah has an orientation, a historical orientation. Okay, but the question is, you know, why? <laughs> um, and uh, and it all has to do with prophecy. You know, what what separates an evangelical from a critical scholar is belief in the supernatural. Belief in prophecy, belief in the fact that God can do this. God can actually say, here are my plans, and those plans actually happen, right? That's what separates the evangelical from the non-evangelical, let's put it that way. So uh, it's a matter of do we take the text seriously or not? Uh, do we take it at face value or not? All right, so anyway, that's background for what I want to share with you. Um, Here's a different outline uh, of the book, uh, just kind of bringing out the contexts where basically scenarios one and two are in the Assyrian context. But then if you go down to the bottom, sorry, you might not be able to see the bottom, but down at the bottom, we have those two other contexts. So the projected oracles addressing the exiles is scenario three. And then scenario four is projected oracles addressing the post-exilic situation. 
The key word here is, is projected. That's what I want you to think about, okay? It's prophecy after all, right? So it, it can talk about things that are future, right? So God can do that, right? Uh, so projected, that's a very key word. Um, but what excites me is how it connects with the scroll here. I think this outline is actually a better outline. This, this outline for the book of Isaiah is, um, is something that actually comes from the study of the scroll. And I think it actually represents the book a whole lot better uh, than a strictly historical outline. I mean, look, the previous one, this is good. It's, it, it's good, it tells you the history. This is, this is actually really helpful. But this one, the so-called bifid analysis here, um, bifid, however you want to put it, um, it's a two-part kind of um, panel one and panel two type thing. Uh, it's a two-part analysis that represents the literary structure of the book of Isaiah. Notice that on the left side, part one, you have letters A through G, and in so seven parts, right? Uh, A through G, and, and that takes you from chapter one to chapter 33. The second panel, part two, takes you also A through G, so you got another you know, seven um, units there, and those are all parallel to part one, right? So part two is a parallel panel with part one. Is that making sense? So if you look at the A portions, of course, in A, uh, in part one, you've got judgment and restoration. You know, jump over to part two, you've got desolation and restoration. Well, it's the same thing, right? Thematically, these are actually the same, thematically. But they're parallel portions. So chapters one through five is parallel with chapters 34 and 35. Are you tracking with me on that? Okay, and on and on it goes. Chapters six through eight in, in the portion B, biographical and historical oracles, that's the material that's mostly about Ahaz and his lack of trust in the Lord. Well, it's parallel with the other letter B, chapters 36 through 39, which is all about Hezekiah and how he did listen to the prophet and did take God at his word, take, took God seriously. These are meant to be contrasted. We're meant to read these in parallel and read them as, um, this is how we're meant to read the whole book, okay? Um, the book is divided into two parts. Don't let the critical scholars tell you there are three parts when literarily the whole thing is structured in two halves. Now, how does this relate to the scroll before us? Um, so this is a facsimile picture as well. But this, this join right here, uh, where we have a, a, a join of two leaves right here, this is right about in the center. So I mean, if you, if you were looking you know, in the center of the display right around this point, um, you'll see exactly the column I'm talking about. What I want you to notice is the space. Uh, I, was, I was mentioning, um, where's Samuel? Uh, where, yeah, thank you. I was mentioning this to Samuel just before we started. Um, there's a space here at the bottom of this column, okay? Some, you might need to stand up, I'm sorry. But you can also go and look at the actual thing. So um, anyway, the spacing here is very significant. If you compare this column to this column, you'll see that the space at the bottom is about three lines worth of Hebrew, okay? So you've got three lines, which could have been written here, but were not. This, by the way, is the biggest gap in the entire scroll. There's no gap this large. There is no gap this large in the entire scroll, okay? Um, there are, you know, single line gaps, like here and here, and there. they're all over the place but there's nothing that's like a two line gap or a three. We've got a big one here. Now typically uh, what happens at the end of a column is the scribes typically go right into the next chapter and, and they, don't, you know, they don't start chapters cleanly at the top. 
They, they just keep running the text, okay? Except for here. Here, chapter 33 ends right there, okay? That's the end of chapter 33. The beginning of chapter 34 is up at the top of this column, okay? Um, that's significant because it's exactly in the center of the book where we have this giant gap, right where I was saying, right in the middle, okay? So the, the book is, uh, it has two halves to it, uh, and right in the center, the scribes stopped, okay? They stopped there, they took a break, because they were at the midpoint of the entire composition. And then they start fresh at, th at the top of the column for chapter 34 and following. Um, this indicates to us that the scribes at Qumran read the book of Isaiah in two panels, looking at it this way, you know, with the two parallel parts. This is how they were reading it. This is an ancient reading tradition for Isaiah, and it's one that, frankly, has been lost in modern analyses of the book of Isaiah. It's not there today in the commentaries. Um, but it's in, the, it's in the earliest manuscript. It's right there. So anyway, that's the first thing I just get excited about, so I, I needed to share that with you. All right. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Uh, I did mark it with a uh, uh, highlight there just so you can see the space. This is basically white space, so to speak, although it's kind of brownish, but, it's, um, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's a white space that is there intentionally. All right. Well, um, I should probably make this next point quickly, but I want to talk about the fact that um, one of the important things about the book of Isaiah is when God makes a big deal out of, um, out of Cyrus. And so that's, that's here. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for this, but uh, the decree of Cyrus is very important. So the date I give here is 538. Uh, King Cyrus II, uh, he makes a decree um, that all of the displaced Israelites so these would be Israelites who were deported out of Israel, and, and they were deported into Mesopotamian cities. So they're the diaspora, right? Um, basically, when Cyrus comes to power, he, he takes over the Babylonian empire. Uh, he overthrows the empire, and he is the Medo-Persian king who ushers in the, the Persian period. Uh, he's the first. He's the conqueror, right? So um, anyway, one of the first things he does is he says, well, Babylon is a mess. We've got all of these uh, foreign displaced people groups in greater Babylon, and I want to clean this up, Cyrus says. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send all these people groups back to their original homelands, and I'm going to actually pay for the rebuilding of their temples and... Um, and allow them to flourish back in their homelands. Well, this is, of course, the Bible, the Bible talks a lot about this, but we also have texts um, uh, from, they're in Babylonian, they're from the time of, of Cyrus himself. But there, it's, this is a direct fulfillment of what Isaiah prophesied, right? So we, we have here from Isaiah chapter 44 um, and into chapter 45, I am the Lord who says of Cyrus. Now keep in mind, the prophet Isaiah, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah about somebody named Cyrus. And if you're hearing this, like as if you're like in the audience of Isaiah, you're going, what is a Cyrus? Who or what is Cyrus? I have no idea. Um, he says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will carry out everything I desire. Saying of Jerusalem, it will be rebuilt. Well, what do you mean? We're in Jerusalem. We're hearing this right now. What do you mean it'll be rebuilt? That doesn't even make sense. So that implies it's going to be destroyed? Yeah, and there's more. And of my temple, your foundation will be laid again. So wait a minute. This implies that the temple will be destroyed. Again, these are future things that God is revealing. Thus says the Lord to his Mashiach, to his anointed. This is, by the way, Mashiach with a small M, not capital M. 
Uh, this Mashiach is Cyrus, who is being used by God, whose right hand I have strengthened to subdue nations before him, so that you will know that I, the Lord, who call you by name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, Israel, my chosen, I have called you Cyrus. For Jacob, my servant's sake, Israel, my chosen, I have called you, and he has established you with a name, though you do not know me. Right? So interesting. Um, God is talking about, he's calling out this Cyrus character and giving the name of Cyrus long before Cyrus was born. Okay? And God is going to use this character to bring the Jewish people back to their homeland, and he's going to use him to rebuild the temple and everything else. So pretty phenomenal. The Cyrus cylinder, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the cylinder gives the um, actual decree of Cyrus, and he did this for many displaced peoples in his new kingdom. So there's a quote there from the cylinder. All right. Okay, anyway, fulfilled prophecy. Um, some other details about that are listed here. Cyrus the Persian is identified by name in these chapters. Uh, keep in mind some of the dates, when Cyrus was born, when he came to the throne, uh, when he conquered Babylon, and when he issued his famous decree. Um, otherwise here, there's uh, just keep the dates in mind as well. God... God detailed plans for Israel's restoration 160 years in advance, okay? So if, if we're thinking about when the prophecy was given, when Isaiah lived in the 8th century, it's 160 years later when we see the fulfillment of these things in this person known as Cyrus, all right? Why does God do this? He does it to reveal himself. God does this as revelation or as a self-disclosure. God is saying, here are my plans, watch me do them. Okay, why does he do it? So that they may know from the east to the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, there is no one else. By the way, um, all my biblical quotations are coming from this Dead Sea Scroll Bible, DSSB, and you'll see in my... my uh, quotes. Uh, this, is, um, this was translated by Marty Abeg and Peter Flint and Eugene Ulrich, the Dead Sea Scroll Bible. Um, this is phenomenal. And uh, their, their Isaiah translation in here actually comes from exclusively from this scroll, from 1Q Isaiah A. And uh, that's actually not the case with all their others. They, they kind of do an eclectic mix of different manuscripts as they piece together their translations, but not so with Isaiah. They actually follow this one because it's the best preserved. Okay, there's that. All right, next, I'm gonna close with this one, Isaiah 53, because um, I wanna have some time for Q&A too. So Isaiah 53, uh, you might know, this is, um, this is the perhaps height of the servant songs. Uh, this is in so-called Second Isaiah. Um, but this is some of the most messianic stuff. But by the way, you know, the book of Isaiah, as I've already said, is, is messianic. It has a lot to say about Messiah. We know more about the messianic profile from Isaiah than from any other book of the Bible. Okay? We know more about the Messiah from Isaiah than from any other book of the Bible. Okay? Um, I, I like to say in my survey class that Isaiah is the most messianic of the major prophets, whereas Zechariah is the most messianic of the minor prophets. So in terms of piecing together the messianic profile, Isaiah is, is primary. Zechariah is a very close second, okay? But Isaiah has just a lot of material. I mean, we're getting into the Christmas season. We're going to be singing, you know, Handel's Messiah pretty soon and so forth. This is like straight out of Isaiah. Um, but Isaiah chapter 53 is uh, particularly wonderful because it feels so familiar to us who follow Yeshua HaMashiach. What we're looking at here is chapter 53, 
So, and you can see it uh, on the facsimile in front of you. Uh, the, the easy way to identify the column, it's, it's this column here. Uh, this is where Isaiah 53 is located. But there's this nice stain, okay, in the, uh, in the join between the leaves of the parchments. Uh, so you can see the stain pretty distinctly on the facsimile here. Uh, just to the left of that stain is, is chapter 53. Um, the arrow uh, I put uh, up here, it's just highlighting the, where the tetragrammaton is, just so you can see the name of God here, uh, yod He vav He. Um, you can say Yahweh. Um, in the Jewish reading tradition, they say Adonai when they see the divine name. Um, and that's what I have in the detail. So this is the divine name here, okay? So Yod is here. Uh, he is the large character. And then Vav is the hook right there, the fish hook. And then the final He. Uh, so Yod, He, Vav, He. Um, this is... Uh, this is the arm of the Lord. Um, and the arm of the Lord um, uh, um, on, on whom? Um, and so anyway, this is from verse one. Uh, this is from verse one of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Okay. So it's Uzroah Adonai al me. So uh, the arm of the Lord. Anyway, that's, um, that's what we have there. I just wanted to show you a close-up there of the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton is, of course, all over the place in the text, and, uh, but that's what it looks like in case you're trying to, to find it. All right. Uh, let me close with this, and then we can, we can chat. Um, Isaiah 53, just a few verses uh, that are well known, but I, I think it's worth reading and uh, just making a quick comment about. Uh, these are the verses that really jump out at me. Of course, the entire chapter deserves our attention, um, but it just feels so familiar for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he was despised and rejected by others and a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. Surely he has borne our sufferings and carried our sorrows. Uh, if I could just comment here, for me, this is a very special part of the prophecy because it's speaking about how he is, you know, the traditional translation, acquainted with grief, right? Um, here they translate, um, that he's familiar with suffering. It actually is a slightly different form than the Masoretic text there. Uh, when it says familiar with suffering in verse three, uh, the Qumran text actually has like an active verb there. He knows suffering. Um, whereas it's just a slight difference in the Masoretic where it's more of a passive. And so we translate it acquainted from the Masoretic text. But anyway, um, anyhow, I digress, but, um, uh, this is special to me, uh, just because pain and suffering is a part of my life all the time. I have a lot of chronic issues and, um, and so to know that the Lord's Messiah is one who knows our pain. He's one who intimately knows our pain, our suffering, um, this is by God's design. God sent the Messiah to actually be, be a human, uh, to experience what we experience. And that was intentional, okay? And it's very clear statements here. So I, I really resonate with this. This is special to me. Um, he is familiar with suffering and he bears our sufferings. He carries our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. Verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that made us whole was upon him, and by his bruises we are healed. I want to just underscore here the very personal purpose 
for which the Messiah was crushed and bruised and killed. Um, it was for us. It was for our benefit. This is part of God's design. And uh, we read this, you know, having a relationship with Christ, we read this and we say, well, who else could this be talking about? This is so obviously about Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. It's so obvious. Anyway, what he suffered was for us. Furthermore, he suffered it so that we can be whole, as it says here. Uh, it, It was a punishment on him that made us whole. It was by his bruises that we are healed. So the purpose is that we can be made whole. The purpose is so that we can be healed. Uh, This is all God's design. Verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each of us to his own way. And Adonai, the Lord, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our pain, suffering, our sin was laid on the Messiah. And he suffers in our stead. He suffers what we, of course, deserve. And um, I, we could go on and read this passage. It's incredible. All of the details that are, that are said here about the Messiah that uh, when we read in the Gospels, the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus, as we read all of this, there are just so many connections with Isaiah 53. I mean, Isaiah 53 is like, it says it all about who Jesus is. And, um, and when you see Jesus in the Gospels, you can't help but think, ah, this was told, this was revealed. Jesus is the suffering servant that, Messiah, that, that Isaiah was talking about. So praise the Lord. Uh, we, we believe the Lord's word. And, uh, and it does not return void. So that's Isaiah 53 for us. I'm going to conclude with that. And uh, yeah, very good. So I'm going to leave it there. And I'll close with a, uh, a little Biola slide. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Way, thank you so much for that compelling presentation. Uh, We have a little time for Q&A. So you have a three by five card, I believe, that was on your seat. And we're going to have some students that will come around and grab them from you. And then they're going to bring them up to me. And we'll start Q&A shortly. Uh, I thought I might just, while we're waiting for some of the cards, I might seize the prerogative of the interviewer. And I I was delighted to hear that you spoke about presuppositions. Yeah. Um. This is something that I'm talking about. My seniors in the room will know this. We've been talking about knowledge and presuppositions. Yeah, thank you, Parker. Um, It matters a great deal uh, what presuppositions we bring to the text. It will color how we read the text and how we understand the text. And um, I had the privilege of of being in some academic settings where... um, I was with some folks from, uh, I want to see what I want to say here. I was with a professor from Harvard, Mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking about the prophecies of Daniel and how Daniel predicts the subsequent empires. Mm -hmm. And he made a comment. He said, and of course we know that Daniel didn't actually write this. My hand immediately went up. And I said, when you say we know are you referring to evidence that you have that Daniel didn't write this? And he just looked at me, and it was one of the most shocking moments in my seminary career. He said, no, I don't have any evidence. We just don't believe that that sort of thing can happen. Right. That's and it was this really yep. shocking moment yep. of revelation for me mm-hmm. that there were presuppositions in play mm-hmm. that colored the way that the text was interpreted. And so uh, all that is a really elaborate lead up to, I wonder if you might speak a little to and help the audience understand the, the critical disposition coming out of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Absolutely. And how some of our archaeological findings, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Bula with Isaiah's yeah. name on it, mm-hmm. 
have undercut uh, some of those presuppositions yeah. in the academy? Yes. Um, like you said, the, these scholars who make these assertions uh, about Daniel or Isaiah or any other biblical text, um, they're coming from a secularist worldview, a secularist perspective uh, in which there is no room for the supernatural. And um, anything that smacks of miracle or a work of God uh, is immediately dismissed, like, like it's not possible. Um, so it's a secularist worldview. That, that's the, the presupposition that they're, they're bringing to the text. Um, it's a very, uh, it, this is why we call it a critical perspective, because it's critical of the text that they're looking at, right? It doesn't take the text that just face value and for what it's claiming. Um, it's critical of the message of the text because, um, because the critic does not share the worldview of the text. The, 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 the worldview presented in the text is a supernatural worldview. Uh, it's, a, it's a world in which there is a God named Yahweh, and he is active, and he speaks, and we take that seriously. The text takes that seriously. Uh, but modern critical scholars, of course, dismiss that out of hand. It's impossible. It's impossible to them. And indeed, uh, if you have a rigidly scientific worldview coming out of developmentalism and so forth of the 19th century, um, um, there is no room for, for miracle or for God. So, uh, right, it's all about presuppositions. Thank you. We have a couple questions that are asking, is the parallel that was shown in the book of Isaiah, parts one and two, characteristic of any other books in the Bible? Not exactly, <clears throat> but, um, but yes, I mean, the pattern is visible in many places where you have like parallel panels. Um, uh, even, even if you consider something like a narrative, like the book of Judges, uh, where you have um, uh, in the major judges, so-called major judges, you have basically three stories. Then you get the center story of Gideon, and then you get three more major stories. Um, that's a similar pattern, um, not quite the same as what's going on literarily in Isaiah, but, but it's, a, it's a similar pattern where you have like a ABC, and then you get a D by itself and judges, and then you get a um, CBA type thing. So, so a similar kind of parallel structure. There, it's a bit more chiastic in judges, where it's got a centerpiece, um, but... Uh, in Isaiah, it's more just, you know, you get A through G, and then you get A through G again, uh, repeated. So um, anyway, this kind of patterning is all over scripture. Um, it's a literary form that is an ancient, common form. Um, you know, in ancient Mediterranean literature, um, you can say ancient Near Eastern literature, they are often thinking in chiastic patterns, or we could say maybe cyclical patterns, where you know you begin talking about something and then you move to your high point in the middle and then you come back around to your original point. So you end the way you begin and so forth. Uh, this kind of parallelism and repetition is all over scripture. And uh, so it doesn't surprise me in the least that Isaiah is using similar forms, yeah. So another question, uh, you went to Hebrew Union for your graduate work, uh, and this question asks, how do Jewish scholars uh, handle or interpret Isaiah 53? Hmm. They don't. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my particular training was at a Reform Jewish seminary. Uh, it was a rabbinic school, a Reform rabbinic school, Hebrew Union College. I went to their mother campus in Cincinnati. The Reform Jewish movement actually started in Cincinnati, Ohio, so kind of a strange fact. 
Um, but, uh, and so that's where the PhD program was located as well. Um, when I came there, uh, it was, I didn't have to hide the fact that I was a Christian. Uh, they knew I was a Christian and they gave me a full scholarship anyway. So I was very grateful. But they also made it clear when I came there that uh, I was not to proselytize. I was not to uh, be an evangelist while I was a student. Um, they said, you know, you're coming into our turf, our territory, and you're a guest here. And I said, okay, I understand. So anyway, um, but I found that many of the students did engage me, uh, many of the faculty as well, about my faith. Uh, they were curious about it. They wanted to understand it. Um, and, uh, but it was mostly, from their perspective, they were mostly interested in my Christianity as like a, you know, a Jewish Christian dialogue. Um, they were not curious for their own sake, but more curious just for an, a public forum kind of civic sake, <laughs> you know, uh, because the, the rabbis who are training there um, are going to lead congregations where they, um, where they will be doing, you know, dialogues with Christian uh, audiences. And so that was important to them. Um, we didn't talk much about Isaiah 53. Uh, that was the thing. Um, and if you ask them to comment on it, they'll just talk about the suffering servant being the nation of Israel, which it is. Okay, they're not wrong about this. Their interpretation that the suffering servant is Israel is actually what the text says. That, that's okay. Um, when, we, when we as Christians talk about the fulfillment of this in Christ, um, that doesn't negate the fact that Israel is a suffering servant. Because of course, one of the things Matthew's gospel teaches us clearly is that Jesus is Israel. I mean, it's very clear in, the, in, in Matthew's gospel. So he is, Matthew is, is, is connecting these very things where, yes, everything you know about the suffering servant from Isaiah 53, right, you should recognize that in Yeshua because he embodies this. He is the embodiment of Israel as the Messiah. So anyway, I, I digress. But that's me talking, that's not them talking, so uh, sure, to sure. your question, so. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. A couple of questions, uh, you mentioned s some slight differences between uh, the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scroll text. Um, people were asking, are there other significant differences or insignificant differences that are of note between the texts? Things that we've learned as scholars mm -hmm. that this text has help us, helped us understand. Better. No, there are many, many differences uh, between the Masoretic text and the Isaiah, the Great Isaiah Scroll, but they're all minor. They're, they're, I would say there's nothing significant. I can, I can drone on and on about the little details that are different, but they're very minor. You know, well, we're talking about a few examples of yeah. Minor so, difference. so like the one I referred to, <laughs> even about acquainted with grief. You know, um, when we talk about there's one little difference, um, and it's basically a vowel letter. It's a, it's a letter that marks a vowel. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they have an extra vowel added that is not in the Masoretic vocalization. Um, and it's just a slight nuance of like, well, did he know grief in an active sense, or was it more of a passive thing? Well. That's, that's the minor kind of difference we're talking about. Um, so, and, and what we're talking about, when we're talking about the actual graphic differences between the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scroll text, um, we're talking about a vowel. It's one vowel, okay? That, that's what we're talking about. And, and it's literally a jot. Um, it's a jot that the scribe puts in. So um, much of that vowel tradition was tradition and uh, the scribes put it in where they thought it was correct and appropriate because it was part of their reading tradition. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe on that fine point, maybe the Isaiah scroll is better than the Masoretic text. Um, it probably is. There's many examples like that, but they're all minor. They're just minutia. 
and they're usually about vocalization issues, um, which is vowel issues. So um, minor, minor stuff. There's, no, there's nothing major to speak of, honestly. Uh, the bottom line is the Masoretic text from, say, the 10th century AD, like the, the Aleppo Codex or something, um, that text is basically confirmed by the Isaiah scroll, right? The Isaiah scroll from Qumran is virtually identical to the text that we had for thousands of years, um, for a thousand years. Uh, it, it shows that it's reliable. It shows that actually our Bibles today are based on a reliable text by their, you know, any of the modern translations today, whatever one you're reading, they're all based on the Masoretic Hebrew text, like the Aleppo or the Leningrad Codex. Um, those are, um, those are from the 10th century AD, but they match what is here, which we, we now call this the proto-Masoretic text. It means like, this is the text before the Masoretic text, what you have in front of you. Uh, so it's the proto-Masoretic. In other words, it matches the tradition that the Masoretes were working on. It's the same tradition. Yeah. Someone asked, who were the Essenes and what happened to them? Yeah, so um, the fate of Qumran. Qumran is the city that, um, you know, where the scrolls were found, all the caves uh, were around this town of Qumran. The Essenes were the people living there. Uh, they were the people of Qumran. Um, this was a very small sect of Judaism uh, in the Roman period, in the first century. Uh, and it ended abruptly. In, in Qumran's case, it ended in 68 AD. This is because, of course, the Romans completely destroyed Jewish civilization at that time. So at 68, the site was abandoned because the Romans drove everybody out. Um, and they were basically erased from history. So we don't really have Essenes after 68 uh, AD. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I think Scott mentioned, or somebody mentioned, uh, there, were, there were multiple uh, sects of Judaism in the first century. You know, people like the Essenes. You also, of course, we know the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Um, the zealots, the, I mean, there, there, were, there were many of them. But here's the thing, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and, civil, and Jewish civilization in 70 AD was the final blow, when the Romans did that, only one sect of Judaism survives. And that's the Pharisees. The Pharisaic tradition survives past the Roman period. Everything we basically have in Judaism today is built on the Pharisaic tradition. And so the only thing that we have from the Essenes is what's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have many sectarian texts that you know, attest to the Essene beliefs and so forth. Um, there's a lot of them, things like the community rule uh, and other texts. But, um, but modern Judaism is based on a, a different sect. It's not based on the Essenes at all. It's based on the Pharisaic tradition. So the Mishnah comes from the Pharisees. You know, that's a, that was collated later, but it's, it's basically preserving the Pharisaic interpretations. The Talmud is, of course, an exposition on the Mishnah, and on and on it goes. Um, but that's all within the Pharisaic tradition. That's, that's all that exists today. Okay, one last question, and this will be a nice lead-in to getting another opportunity to see the scrolls. Someone noted, at the end of the scroll, I saw some words written between the lines. Since the scribes copying the scrolls had to ensure that the text be perfect, what are those? Yeah, um, these are corrections. Um, basically, the scribes noticed that you know, a line might be missed. Uh, inadvertently. So these are mistakes that the scribes made, but they're mistakes that the scribes noticed that were made, and they corrected it. 
And so uh, this is very common in early manuscripts where you see corrections or additions written in the margins or in between lines. Usually it's very crammed. And, um, uh, and these, are, these are corrections. You know, perhaps this is one of the reasons why this particular scroll uh, was put into a cave. Um, it was retired. Um, it was still honored, um, and, uh, but, but maybe, maybe they just felt like, um, maybe they had an updated version, and so they put this one to rest. Um, that's probably the case. So these are, these are minor errors that occurred that the scribes, see, with the, the thing is the scribes who copy these manuscripts painstakingly they check and recheck and recheck and recheck to make sure it's right. And so when they find something wrong, they correct it. And that's what these are. Yeah. Wonderful. Dr. Wei, thank you so much for this presentation. <laughs> Friends, we have about 30 minutes left. You can come up. Feel free to take another look at the scroll. And uh, please be sure to join us again in the spring for our Thomas Jefferson TGC. Thanks for coming.